Adrian Fraser from Galway, thank you very much for doing this. I'm holding up here the biography of George Moore so that um, you can tell me who, who he was. Who was George Moore? Uh, George Moore was the uh, first born son of a landlord in County Mayo, Moore Hall, on Loch, above Loch Cara. Um, and he, his father died when he was just 19 and more inherited this vast 12,000 acre estate. But his ambition, had, he'd already formed an ambition to be a painter and he wanted to go to Paris and become a painter. But he found um, he didn't have the talent to, to measure up to the other painters in the studio and he took to writing and was a, a uh, disciple of Zola's originally. Uh, but by the mid 80s, he had broken away from naturalism. Really after his, after a mummer's wife, kind of 1885, he had broken away and experimented uh, into experimenting in a lot of kind of aesthetic forms of writing, even stream of consciousness, and that sort of thing in the 1890s, 1880s. Um, and some of those experiments didn't work really very well. Um, I mean, he did enormous stylistic variety. So about 1894 is a return to try, try and write a more steadily in a realist, uh, realistic novel. Um, and that, that novel was, uh, was a big success for him really. Um, but he never, he never tried to write another like it, I don't think. Um, and his, um, his reputation as a novelist is shadowed to some extent by his reputation as a gossip monger and as a memoir writer um, of very entertaining and scandalous accounts of those years with Yeats and Lady Gregory and others in Dublin. So that- Absolutely. And he, he even had the book he wrote in, the, in kind of the mid, nineteen mid 1980, like 1889, before Esther Waters, Confessions of a Young Man is like the first outing of that character uh, that he turns himself into a kind of comic clownish, uh, um, he makes sport of himself really. Um, he does a lot of farcing and shameless behavior uh, as a character that he is you know, controlling. Um, he's brilliant at that. I mean, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of what people are doing with you know talking about auto fiction now is that Moore was out of the gate early on that. Um, and and Esther Waters is really extraordinary because first of all, it's just so good, and it's such a surprise to find a nineteenth you know a late nineteenth century novel that is a classic and yet isn't really read as such. Um, I wonder if you could give us the ingredients that went into it. I mean, you talk about Zola and rejecting Zola. You talk about him going to Paris to think of studying as a painter. And, and, and I'm wondering about that idea of what painters, when he went, what painters were working with when he went to Paris. In other words, painting people of lower classes, including barmaids, you know, and making them, giving them a sort of inner spirit um, in the work, that there were many things he learned in France. It, it didn't mean he had, they had to stay with them, he could unlearn them. But nonetheless, he was, un, he, was not, he was unusual as a novelist in the English language. Perhaps Henry James is another example, who did spend time in Paris and who did study what was happening in French novel and French paintings. And this did make a difference to Esther Waters. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, uh, it, it, now that you mention it, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, like Moore was writing essays about Degas. He knew Degas. Degas thought Moore was a brilliant character. You know, he had a great mind. Is that they, they knew one another. He's writing about Degas kind of just the year before he starts Esther Waters. And Degas' pictures of uh, washing women and servant girls, not just the ballet dancers, but he did a lot of pictures of women that were also down and out. Um, there is an element of the dignity of portraiture given to people that had not before, you know, ha had a kind of grandmaster painter uh, pay attention to them. 
that might have gone into Moore's uh, Moore's planning. I think it, he it was just looking at some notes today, and he's it, the book before he had finished a book called Mike Fletcher, and it's really about Frank Harris. I mean, it's a nasty, nasty, uh, sexually violent, egotistical hero of the book. And he showed it to Harris and Harris said, no, 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 he didn't like it. He, well, he didn't like the look in the mirror, but the, the book is, um, it's, it's an amoral portrait of a totally amoral character. And Moore found, found him fascinating and nobody liked the book. And Moore thought, oh, I'm not gonna do this again. You know, I am now, I'm going to uh, subdue my attention to the most ordinary daily pieties of existence, you know, the daily bread of humanity. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to look at a, a perfectly normal English person. And I'm going to, you know, uh, write this steadily and I'm going to write a really good book. I'm going to write, you know, this time I'm not going to fail. And yeah. the, he really put his whole, whole heart into it. There, there, there was another novel that he'd written almost a decade earlier that might have also helped him by being something he wasn't also going to repeat, which is a novel set in Ireland called A Drama in Moslin, which is yeah. his attempt to look at that thing that other novelists would too, that fading Anglo-Irish, that sense of these girls who were being brought up for marriage, and suddenly there was no vice-regal court anymore. The Invincibles are in the novel. And then there is a sense of a fading Anglo-Ireland. And it is a sense also that there's nowhere much more for a novelist to go with this. It, 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 there's a greater, almost a genetic weakness in these characters that he cannot do anything more with. And mm -hmm. so what's fascinating is he's moving with Esther Waters to England, to making an entirely English novel. Yeah. But, but, but I wonder if, if you share that view about a, a drama in Muslim, which I mean, it's, it's a very good novel, but, but, but there's a sense of ending in it. There's a sense of twilight in it. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's the uh, end of a whole uh, regime that he's depicting, um, not just a, a woman's life, you know, a sort of a doll's house applied to a daughter of the uh, land, landed aristocracy in the west of Ireland, but the end of that whole feudal setup in Ireland. But the, I think he, in those years, you know, like even when he was writing that book, he was living with his family uh, down uh, near Brighton on the coast, Shoreham, the Bridger family. And um, it's like the, it's, it's the model for the house at the beginning of Esther Waters. Um, Mrs. Bridger is the same as the lady in that house. This but he awesome. loved them. And they were Protestants. And he, uh, he, he was, wrote some fairly silly things about how much he loved English Protestants. You know, that he had completely overcome this. He thought they were the strangest people in the world. You know, the Bible in one hand and the gin bottle in the other. And, uh, uh, you know, the coal mine starts at the end of the cricket pitch. And he, he, he thought they were an absurd people, but he, was, he had come to love them and to laugh at them. And the, um, he, he just couldn't believe they had, you know, taken over the, em they were the their empire had straddled the world. They were such an absurd people. And the, um, and he, you know, he was, his best friend was the Bridger's son. He slept with the bridge, the, the, that guy's sister. He was, he was, you know, all in the family. And, the, and his, his love for them comes out in the book, really. Yeah. Um, um, there, 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 was, there was a time when I read the book at the beginning, I mean, when I read the book first years ago, I, I really did think that he had found elements of Ireland, of, you know, um, a, a, a big house with horses, with a lot of servants, with a lot of land, with a lot of coming and going, mm. and, and, and that he had found it impossible to write, a, uh, to write a novel where someone, a servant in that house could confront her destiny without having to deal with land war, Invincibles, um, Protestant Catholic, the fall of Parnell, um, the Irish cultural revival, you know, all yeah. of these 
would, would get in on, on her, especially the Protestant Catholic thing. Yeah. And what I decided yeah. to do was, you know, just take his, take his luggage really and take it across the water and make a sort of metaphor for Ireland in his English scene. But I was looking at your, I mean, I was reading the section on drama in Muslim, brilliant section in your biography. Mm. And it seems to me that you, you really changed my mind on this in that, that it is really an English book. It, is, it, it, it isn't as though he's trying to write about Ireland and making it England, just calling it England, that these are actual English people and that there's an English world being described. Yeah, I think he believed that that's what he was doing and that's what he wanted to do. Um, do you believe that it? He, um, that he wasn't like so, Beerbaum when he read the book he says yeah it's a great book it's a great but it's not an English book it's a French book about English people <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yes. he's not in, doesn't belong in English literature at all but I, I think he he was and he he did think you know that when I'm doing this, I'm not going to do any of the Dickensian things. You know, there's going to be no uh, sensational um, turns of affairs. People aren't going to be rescued from misery. They aren't going to triumph. They aren't going to, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to exclude all of the humor, the excitement, the sensationalism, the sentimentalism. I'm going to just look, I'm just going to show this life. I'm going to be the recording angel for this life. I'm going to completely subdue myself to what happens to her. And her uh, that will give her life meaning and dignity. I think he, he, I mean, she was a specimen Protestant English woman for him. But at the same time, um, he, he didn't want to write an English novel. You know, it was about England, but not in, not in an English manner. Um, is he in dialogue then with both Zola and with Thomas Hardy over ideas of, of I, I was going to say Zoom, but I mean doom, ideas of doom and ideas of predetermined outcomes for characters that, that, that in somehow or other, almost in a painterly way, he wanted to free up the idea of character in a novel and allow, to, allow a character herself to dictate her destiny rather than having it arranged for her by some um, sort of system that a novelist like Thomas Hardy on one hand or Zola on the other would invent. In other words, he, he, yeah. he meant business in changing the way the novel would be written. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think in the case of Hardy, like his reaction to Tess of the Durber Durbervilles, like everybody loved that book at the time it was a hit and Moore thought it was ridiculous a ridiculous book just an absurd book there were so many gothic elements in it there was you know characters out of sort of stage like villains come in and rape her and like he really I think that some of it may have been inspired by envy but it was also uh, I can do, I can I'm going to do this and not indulge in any of those excesses. But my, my character is also going to have a child out of wedlock. My character is also going to go through a lot of suffering in the course of a life. And she's going to come out OK in the end. But that it's going to be real. It's not going to be gothic, which is kind of how he understood Hardy. But I, I think with this. What he had begun to think about Zola was that Zola is really a socialist. You know, he's really, he's, he's trying to change the world. He's trying to make the world a better place. And Moore was thinking, that has nothing to do with, with, uh, with art as far as Moore was concerned. I'm not going to, I'm not, even when people, you know, got uh, upset about the baby homes part of the, uh, of the story. Uh, and Moore was delighted, that, but he had certainly no intention of um, reforming the way uh, unwed mothers were treated in England, I don't think. You, you mean that the impulse was to make character and was to free up character and was to see where she would go as a character rather than to say, um, this legislation is required and this book will help legislation. Yeah, yeah, 
yeah. And um, the, the, um, the, his job then, which is really considerable, is to create Esther Waters. And um, the book will fall or it will succeed on the basis of what he does with this, with, the, with, with, this, with this creation. The first thing to be said is that she, he has nothing, it seems, in common with her other than a bad temper. You know, in other words, that the, the whole question of money in the book is something George Moore knew nothing about. He knew nothing about motherhood, breastfeeding, parenthood. He knew nothing about um, Plymouth Brethren. He, did he know? But, but what, 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 what I'm saying is that this act of imagination becomes a great act of empathy. He moves on from being an act of empathy to becoming an act of artistry, whereby he gives her many characteristics. I mean, part of the way in which she can function outside you know, ideas of doom or sort of, you know, gothic excitement is that she herself creates excitement by being a person of many moods, by being yeah. made up of many different characteristics. She, she's sometimes immensely placid, hardworking, biddable and easy. And she goes nuts. It's something just drives her crazy and has to be held back. But he can do that all the time. You know, he judges how much of her he, he, can, he, he can work with here and, and, and how much of the very opposite he can give her. He makes her deeply religious, which is also oddly sensual. I mean, William's shoulders interest her indeed as much as eternal life. Yeah. There, so that she is, isn't she a most interesting figure? Yeah, yeah. He makes her human. I mean, she she comes off as a, a not a, a typical person, but a you know an actual living person. Like I, I love the bit when um, early on when um, you know she's she's taken one beer too many and she's uh, let William do what, what William wanted to do and she wanted to do as well and she's but then afterwards she's quarreling with William who isn't promptly marrying her. And the wealthy lady of the house starts ringing the bell for William to come up and spend time alone with her in her room. And Esther says, you know, this person is completely spoiled. You know, she's lived her life where, you know, she's never taken responsibility for anything. And she thinks she's so superior and she rings the bell and there he runs up the stairs to her. Now, if you take her clothes off and you take my clothes off, there we are, woman to woman. I'm just as good as she is. You know that the but the the strength of um, um, human understanding and belief in her own worthiness is is amazingly touching at that point. Um, she doesn't believe in class. She's just, she you know she sees you know William's grandfather was a had a lot of money. Now William's a, a footman. Uh, and now we're serving tea to people that, you know, are grandchildren of a brewer, is that she, she has perceptions of, uh, that enable her to see through the class system and to see through a lot of other, uh, a lot of the, you know, kind of bourgeois mannerisms of other women that are her employers. I mean, she doesn't accept her position as a servant, really. She's, um, yeah, I mean, she's one small illness from um, destruction. In, in other words, in, in that world of hers, you, you know, if you broke your leg or if you injured yourself, if you grew ill, you know, you're absolutely finished. That, that, yeah. it's, it's the workhouse for you. Um, I, I'm wondering if you think there's, there's an element in the book of a sort of eugenics or a sort of some, something genetic of giving her a sort of strength that she, that she will prevail, that she will survive, that she is in, 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 in a world of natural selection, that Esther Waters has some sort of special life force uh, that will guide her no matter where she goes and that this will, the same thing will happen to her baby. Yeah. And in a way, William has some of the same things that, that they're, it, it, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, though he, the Moores, you know, doesn't, uh, one of the his rules for the writing of the book was, I'm not going to, as a narrate, omniscient narrator, I'm not going to 
philosophize. I'm not going to comment on what happens. I'm not going to, I'm going to stay out of the story if I can. But prior to this, he was reading a lot of Schopenhauer. Uh, and the, he was, he, he took him very seriously. And that Schopenhauer's notion of the one thing that drives people is will. It's a will to survive, a will to be, a will not to die, a will to be fed. Uh, and that it overrules your intellect, your rationality, your mor morality. It's just the will to continue to be. And he, he had an argument with, um, what's the guy's name? Uh, Stead, W.T. Stead about this. Is it, more is saying, you know, stop complaining about human sexuality. Lust is life. Life is lust. It is the will to be, to procreate, to raise your child, to continue to exist. And Stead was shocked. You know, that that's, that's a terrible thing to say. And, and more saying, it's Schopenhauer I'm trying to explain to you. Is that, and I think there's, that thing is in Esther, is that, that just will to, will to, you know, save my baby's will to uh, make life go on. And it's, um, it's a whole, in other words, a, a whole kind of species drive that's inhabiting in the individual. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we can't, um, we can't overestimate the importance of, of Schopenhauer as a philosopher affecting novelists, because mm -hmm. of course it gave, not, for example, in Thomas Mann Buddenbrook's, um, published what, six years after um, mm -hmm. Esther Waters, Schopenhauer is literally invoked in the book as the father is dying. And mm -hmm. the death of the son is somehow or other a sort of weakness, a sort of lack of life force that causes the death to occur. Exactly mm -hmm. the same thing happens in exactly the same year in, in Henry James's The Wings of the Dove. Mm. where it really feels weakness is seen it's not a moral weakness it's actually something to do with the and not even the spirit but some genetic thing some all her siblings have died whereas on the other side in london kate croy and her aunt are tanks they're they're really trains they're they're never going to die you know mm. in, in a novel and uh, so so i think a novelist got huge energy for the making of character from these ideas about life force and uh, Esther Waters, I think, is one of the great creations because, as you say, it, he, the George Moore that we all know from the memoirs, from his letters, from his opinions, he is oddly missing here. He doesn't insert himself at all. There is an extraordinary um, self-suppression in this book in, mm -hmm. in order to make somebody, you know, in, in the same way as a painter might paint another face that, that, yeah. that it is um, so, so unlike him. It is yeah. as though you realize if I don't do this, I, I never will be the artist I believe I am. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, I can't remember where, I think they might be in Texas, but there's a um, there's manuscript of the novel of several drafts and the, um, he was writing it over three years, but he wrote two or three other books during those that time as well. But in the in the uh, first draft, like the nib never leaves the paper. It just it, it's written really fast, and that when he lays down another sheet, the ink is still wet, and it shows through about a third or a quarter of the way up the page. You know, he's laying one wet page after another. Like he's really writing fast and then he comes back and it's uh there's like um where he'll come to a passage that he um that's overwritten or it's it's literary or he's intruded himself into into the story it's not just x'd out sometimes it's x'd out but at other times it's like a tornado of ink around it like he's just furious with himself yeah. for what he for get out of this story, you know, get out, really? get out of the story. That's and amazing. He, and then he he would write uh, on other paper and then cut it up and paste it on top of uh, the original. But you can, I mean, it's he he really uh, did a lot of reworking of the story in order to 
um, you know, have it consist of plot, character, scenes, not himself. And not, it, it's like, what's weird about it, and I, I thought this a little bit about, like, uh, Brooklyn, is, uh, which is, I think, the most Esther Waters-like story that's probably been written in a long time. But that you had restrained your literary capacities to this character is that you weren't using certain muscles, you know, like uh, that you were, uh, you'd focused uh, in a way on character and you work in a lot other, uh, you know, stylistic te tempests occur in the, in, in the book. Um, yeah, that I mean, I mean, I think if you're writing a book like that, if you break the rule once, it shows so badly that you would end up making those big <laughs> marks. Like, have I lost it? Because you know that you are entirely in the mind of someone who is emphatically not you, and but at the same time, you have to give her a rich way of noticing. You cannot reduce her way of noticing. But, you, but, and so that, it, you know, if you start patronizing her by saying, well, she wouldn't really have noticed that, or she wouldn't have been able to analyze something as you lose her. Mm. Um, and, and, and so, but you cannot start thinking about, um, you know, other issues that maybe preoccupy you as you're writing the book. That, so there is an element of self-suppression, but that has to be compensated by another element. I think it's, it's supremely here in Esther Waters, which is that Esther Waters is constantly watching the world and picking up its elements. I mean, you know, working out what's going on in, in, in a way that's very, very sharp. And that when, when he, she cannot read and, read and write, but, but, but yet her intelligence is never in any way under any doubt in the book. Yeah. Uh, and I think we have to do this, you know, it, it, the, the, I think the more you self-suppress, the more you have to be sure you're doing this part, mm -hmm. that you're not suppressing mm -hmm. someone else's intelligence. Mm, that's interesting, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, the, um, just let's talk about the opening of the book. I mean, you know, we have this um, young woman comes to Big House. It's there, it's in Jane Austen, it's in um, Mansfield Park, it's in Henry James, it's in The Turn of the Screw, it's in a lot of Gothic novels, you know, where there's going to be a ghost in the house or an old story or, 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 you know, an old painting on the wall. But she walks into life. I mean, what's great about the book is that the, that the cliché are, are, are all missing of yeah. that, that um, there's going to be a death. You know, there's going to be that it's actually, the house is so busy that no one notices her at the beginning. She notices them. Mm. And of course, ingeniously, he's gone to horse racing for this purpose. And he's gone to gold braid that they have, a, they own a famous horse. Ingeniously, he has created drama within the house between Mrs. Barfield, who's a Plymouth brethren and really and doesn't believe in horse racing. And the rest of them who are crazy about it and are winning and losing. And, and one can see the, the, the dangers, but also, it's going to give the novel a sort of an excitement. It's going to, I mean, part of your duty as a novelist is to create excitement. If you create too much of it, people will start believing you. But if you don't have any of it, but this opening where Esther doesn't even need to speak, actually, you know, she, mm. she's got a pair of eyes soaking in. And there's a wonderful moment where she's listening, but doesn't understand at all what they're talking about. Mm. And then there are wonderful comic scenes where the, the demon, the jockey, has to lose weight before the race. Mm -hmm. And the, the ingenious way is described as the poor boy has to lose the weight. And then the silence of the house during the race. And then the result. So you have, he has really achieved something amazing by page 30. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, I mean, then he, he certainly, I mean, he knew he knew that horse racing world like anything. I mean, from Warhol and from even more from the Bridgers. But the, he, he also, uh, his guide to the world of horse racing was the family servant at Warhol, this guy named Appleby. Could you just describe Warhol to us? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it was a, beautifully situated 
1780s house uh, high on a hill above this Loch Cara kind of um, lake with a kind of chalky bottom. So it has a very light green, unusual color to the water. And Mariah Edgeworth was his grandmother's dear friend and they would visit back and forth. Uh, but the father, uh, Moore's father got seriously into horse racing and he built a track, a horse down on the level below the hill. And um, he won the Grand National, won the Chester Cup. I mean, he was, he, he, he won so much, so much money that he was able to, during the Irish famine, he was able to uh, pay for a ship to bring cornmeal from New Orleans all the way up to um, County Mayo and distribute it among the tenants. I mean, it's a, but it was a, it was as a big house with vast estates. It was all centered on horse racing, and he and his brother were constantly uh, the father and his father's brother were constantly involved in trying to raise the next great winner that they would bring over to England. Uh, so, I mean, he knew he more was, uh, once they sent him off to school, he was the tipster for the boarding school where he worked. And he was constantly getting tips from the house, the guy in the, in the kitchen at Moore Hall, this William Appleby, they exchanged constant letters about tips. Moore was taking bets off that the other students got in serious trouble for it. But he, 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 in other words, when he began that novel, he he may have been light on his knowledge about uh, Protestant, you know, Protestant women in the serving class, but he knew the horse race. <laughs> or he could do he could do the horse race, you know. He, yeah, yeah. he started with his strong suit. Um, yeah. He started with his strong suit, and then when he has her pregnant. He has many options here now, really, doesn't he? One that she just goes completely down into the depths, that she's to be found in a London that other writers have written about, you know, um, that the re really the misery of it. And then um, he can bring her down to very, very far indeed. I mean, he can he can send her to Australia. Um, but um, first of all, um, the, he does the watching of money just precisely how much money she has, mm. precisely how much she's going to need, precisely how much she's earning. And this wonderful moment um, early in the book where her sister wants two, two pounds from her. And she's really going to get the two pounds. And we're watching Esther desperately trying to hold on to the two pounds. And we're also watching that she's going to give her the two pounds. And so, so we're watching this woman who's known for her, let's say, her stubbornness at this point, her yeah. intelligence at this point, but we also watch her sweetness. We also watch that almost everything in her in certain scenes becomes its opposite, thus giving the novel a sort of energy where you don't know what wind will blow and you don't know what the wind will do to Esther because she may go one way or another. Yeah. She may walk out of the house. You know, she may tolerate something for a while. With each, it's a sort of, it's a sort of picaresque novel by this point that she mm -hmm. goes from house to house to house. And this yeah. is this center of the book is just, you know, there's it, it's a sort of line drawn. The fun part of this is for the reader is that each woman, these 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 Mrs. Um, um, Miss, Mrs. Bingley's and each one treats her differently. But nonetheless, yeah. the system is there. And even though she doesn't see her child, we realize that the child is the is the actual most active character in the book. Yeah. The, this has really taken more out of his comfort zone, out of his racing world, out of the world, yeah. and yet he doesn't lose anything. Yeah, he, he had a lot anything. of women friends, more did. Um, and during those years, um, when he'd go to see them, he'd always ask if he could talk to the, to the servant. You know, he, he, so he he would he'd visit around like he had five or six really close women friends. He 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 always believed his way of writing a story was really he would tell the story to a, a woman friend, a intelligent woman friend, 
And then he'd read her face to see whether she was getting bored or something like that, or whether she was excited by it. He kept retelling it until he'd, he'd shaped a story in conversations with friends. But when he'd visit these four or five women friends, he, in every case, he wanted to talk to the servant and can, can I talk, you know, have a chat with the maid? He'd spend, he'd ask them questions about money and their habits, their, where they'd work, what they were doing next. Did they have children? I mean, he, 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 was, uh, he was a follower of Zola to the extent that he thought you need to find out about life, you know? Uh, you need to talk, go talk to people and uh, write down what they say and learn from them. Um, he, um, so I think the, the variety of middle-class women that you see is also reflective of like a lot of those, you can find, you can identify models for a number of those in real life, you know, of those different women. And I think the, one of the really powerful things about the book, it was a largely female readership uh, by 1890, even not, maybe not so much as today, but there was a, still a very significant female readership. And they would be middle-class women who were reading about something that would cause them to feel ashamed, really. You know, to, to feel self-reproach. Like, the, this, is, this is a character that has been invisible to me that actually works in my house, you know? I, I don't know about her life. I don't know what she's gone through. And uh, the story where the woman is trying to get really Esther's to let her baby die so that she can, and is angry that e Esther won't completely give her breasts to her, this other woman's child and let her child die. I mean, that's a, that is an incredibly morally shocking story, but it is, I mean, that what, that's the mother and baby story in, in English society of that, of that time. They, they were completely exploiting other women so that they wouldn't have to nurse their own children. Um, Adrian, thank you very much. <laughs>